Hi everyone, so I did the next section of this book, um, day four on the 21 most powerful minutes in a leader's day. Today the tennis is on, so I'm just taking some time out to do my talk and then I'll go back to watching it. We're lucky in Canada we have it available on CBC Gym because the are tennis matches coming up where Canadians are playing with the Olympics, so I'll be able to watch it. Normally I just follow along on YouTube on a tennis talk, I listen to it. So today's thought was on the consequences of sin are always great, both for both the leader and the people. And John Maxwell uses Proverbs 4, 18 to 19 and 26 to 27. The path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. So he's basically again going back to the story of Samson and looking at how he deliberately chose the way of sin. He deliberately chose to do what he knew was not pleasing for him, for his people. The Nazarites were not supposed to drink. That was their tradition. But he deliberately did it. And he said, oh, well, you know, in my case, God will have special circumstances. God will understand. Even knowing that it was wrong, he did it deliberately. And then he tried to trick his male companions with a riddle so he could trick them into giving him expensive gifts of clothing. When his wife got him to reveal the secret of the riddle, he was in even deeper. So to pay for the debt, he killed the men for their clothes and then he took a vengeful act. He said, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. And this was by the end of his wedding. So he's already up to his neck in trouble. And with sin, you might say, oh, well, you know, it's just this one time. It doesn't really matter. And it's not hurting anybody. But then what happens is that Delilah tries to deceive him and then what he's done, now she's doing. So she pressed him daily with her words and his soul became vexed to death and he told her all that was in his heart. So it looks nice, it looks, uh, it looks appearing to be good, but they call it the angel of light. So in the Christian tradition, they talk about the angel of light, Lucifer. When you look at something and you think, oh, this looks really good, but then it turns out to be the exact opposite. And it's just like when the angels fell from the heavens because they did not want to serve God. They said, no, we are equal to God, so we can do whatever we like. So what he's uh, teaching about here, it says that it never delivers on the promises it makes. It just causes people to keep going back for more. And that's true whether it's of, um, if you look at drugs or if you look at alcohol addictions or things like that. It just makes you want more and more and more of it. And in the end, it's just leading down a self-destructive path. The price is always higher than what people think it's going to be. And when Samson thinks that he's safe and he could still go free as before, he can't because the sin costs him everything, his leadership, his sight, and ultimately it costs him his life. So he was filled with promise and potential, but he got mired in the sin and he refused to give it up. So he remained in bondage and he remained oppressed until the king of David, nearly a hundred years later, his people remained oppressed. So we can't embrace something that we know is sinful 
and at the same time call ourselves leaders. We can't break up people's homes and call ourselves leaders. So it's up to us to think about what areas we are dealing with and what we do in our church. Yesterday we had the first Friday devotion. So we take that time to examine our conscience and we take that time to say sorry to God for the things that we have done and the things that we have failed to do. And we bring that before the Lord and we ask for forgiveness for our sins. And it becomes a collective thing when, like when there's mass killings. And now the, what, with what's happening in the Gaza Strip, it's really awful to see all the children, all these diseases that are breaking out with all, they've got like sores on their arms, there's cholera outbreaks, there's all kinds of things that have come up that are happening. We had a civil war in Rhodesia, but it wasn't like what's happening there. We, we didn't have this kind of devastation where it became massive and it became like there's things going, the, all this water is becoming contaminated and people are getting sick and that is going to spill over into the oceans and it's going to come to us, to all of us. And you could say it's like when I, of one of many people tweeted to Joe Biden to say, please bring the journalists home that are in Russia. You can say, what's that got to do with you? You mind your own business and you love your life. And when it's my turn, who's going to tweet for me? Who's going to say, don't leave her there in that country? Don't let people take her life. Who's going to do it? Nobody. It's the same thing when we have generations. We have generational examples. So with my dad, when we were small, he used to take my aunt, his sister, my aunt Teresa and his cousin Maggie and Cyril and all of them. He used to take them and drop them off at school, bring them back and he used to pick people up, give them lifts in the hopes that once he was gone, because he knew that his health was not good, people would do that for us. And I am fortunate in my life. I do have people that do that for me here in Canada, as well as in Zimbabwe and England. And I, all I have to do is ask. I don't like to inconvenience people, so I don't ask. I normally will take the bus or take the TTC if something is commutable. But I have very good friends. I have friends that when we're getting together at their place, they'll come here, they'll pick me up, we'll go together to their place, and then they'll drop me off. I have a family like that in England. They'll take me, they'll pick me up from wherever I am, and they'll take me to where I'm going, or they'll once I'm at their place, if I'm going to somewhere that's far away, they'll take me. My friends will come to the airport to meet me in South Africa and they'll drop me off. Not everybody gets that, but that's the example that my dad set and my mother. Because when people used to come to visit us, we didn't just drop them off and drive off. We went into the airport with them we used to have a very nice balcony where you could stand and watch the planes taking off in Zimbabwe at the, it's called Harare now, Harare Airport. It was called Salisbury. So what they used to do, they used to park the car and then come inside and then we would go up and we would stand on that balcony and watch until that plane took off. So it was a nice outing for us and it also set an example for us. When I went home to Zimbabwe, my friends did the same for me, Kashmira and Mita. They took me to the airport and they stayed with me until I had to go in. It was time to board. And the, the people at the airport were so nice. They're like, oh, tell your friends they can come right up to the place where they... <laughs> I said, no, it's okay. They're like, no, no, tell them. So they came right in to just before I had to board, they came right in there 
and then they said uh, goodbye and then they waited till my plane took off and then they left. So it really depends on how you look at life and how you look at your sin. I mean, the same thing with my friends when they come, I'll go to the airport, I'll meet them there. I don't have a car, but I'll go and wait for them. And then when they come, I'll bring them home to my place if they're staying with me. Or if they're staying at a hotel, I'll take them to the hotel and then I'll come home. So that's about, you know, how we pay it forward and how we do things in our lives. And if we're missing the mark, if we have to make um, adjustments, then we can do that. And we can change and we can go into new paths. And with me, if people tell me, oh, please release me and I'm sick of you and I don't want anything to do with you, even if it hurts me, I'll just say, okay. If that's what you want, that's what you want. Because at the end of the day, you can't make anybody love you. I have lots of people who are not my blood relatives, but they are like family for me. I have people like that in Zimbabwe, in England, in South Africa, here in Canada. And everybody has that in their lives. It's sad when family turn against you and they tell you we are not family anymore. But at the same time, it's like, you know what, I've done nothing wrong to you. I've not wronged you in any way. I've not hurt you in any way. I've stood by you through everything. So if that's how you feel, I'm sad for you. I'll still love you. I'll still be your blood relative, whether you like it or not. But that's your choice. Because it's at the end of the day, we are born into certain families. And, and for me, I don't do wrong to anybody. I, I try my very best to live my life openly. And even if people don't like me showing my passion for the entertainers, for Live Aid, for tennis, that's in their heart. It's not in my heart. And those people are millions of miles away from me. They're not like even here in my condo in my neighborhood. Sometimes the tennis players do come here. When the uh, National Bank Open was on, there were a few tennis players here. And you see them, but people just carry on their lives. It's, we don't go and crowd them and hound them. If they want, they come to you and they talk to you. They're free, just like they're free in England. So that's what we do with our faith. And in the Catholic faith, what we do is we Father Chris Ayla, what he does, he takes the Ten Commandments and then he looks at those and he asks us to examine our hearts. And when sin is ignored, it becomes collective sin. That's how we land up having mass graves and mass murders. And we land up having the Holocausts and all that. Because people think, well, I am special. But we all special to God. God loves everybody the same way. And we can either turn towards that or turn away from that. So for me, I just try to go into my faith, deepen myself in my faith. It's like Tina Turner said, she used the Buddhist method. She said that when the mud is there, the roots have to go deeper. And Jesus told us that too in a different way, in the Jewish faith. He said that, you know, all these things that we're doing, we're building bonds and we're collecting things and yes, we can have all these nice things. But like yesterday, we had a, a warning of torrential downpours. And I was like, okay, let's see what happens. And then it just went away. I went for my swim, I came back and the next thing the clouds were all gone. I was like, okay, God, you changed your mind. That's very nice because we need the rain, but we don't need torrential downpours. So that's my faith. It's a very childlike faith, yes, I know. But that is the kind of faith that Jesus wants us to have. It's a childlike faith of a child for its father or its mother. It's a child that doesn't expect the parents to turn on it and take their frustrations out on it. It's a very childlike faith. 
And that's the kind of faith that the saints used to encourage us to have. It's the faith that helps us navigate this life. And it's the faith that led to people coming together, all these artists where we had these concerts around the world, raising money of, to help with famine and all these things. Because when you say there's famine, all the, sh the shops are full. There's lots available. But for those of us who can't afford, who do not have the money in our bank accounts, we are the ones that get affected by the famine. The poorest of the poor. It's not like it's a disaster for everybody. It's only for the poor, the marginalized, those of us who are never fully accepted in our families, in our communities, in our institutions. It's where there's racism and where it's the blonde is more valued than the brunette or the black haired girl. It's all those kinds of things. So it's an interesting concept to take and to reflect on. And there's all sorts of, some people are saying now that this opening ceremony that they had at the Olympics, the artists that put that into place said that it is a mockery of the Last Supper. And apparently it is on Instagram and that's on Father Chris's talk from this first Friday. So, I mean, for me, I just, you know, I just watch the games. I enjoy them for what they are. And I don't pay too much attention to that because I know that my faith is in the Lord. And I know that people are going to do that. Whatever they do, they, they're going to do it. And if we become like the kind of people that take revenge and start beheading people and killing people and doing all that because people are choosing to make a mockery of something, then what's the point? I just leave them. I'm like, yeah, you know what? You know what you're doing. So you go ahead and do what you think. But at the end of the day, God is always with us and God sees everything. And that's the way the world has become. So we have to deepen our own faith and examine our own hearts and our own lives and to move forward. And at the end of the day, you can't make anybody love you. If they feel that their family is so and so and it's not me, yeah, it hurts. But you know what? So be it. Because I've lived alone for a long, long time and I've learned to just put my faith in God and to love the people around me and to appreciate them. And when I go home, when I go to Zimbabwe or England or South Africa, I know there's people there waiting to welcome me. And they are family friends or they are friends of mine and I'm like family to them. And that's perfectly fine.